Okay, sorry for the delay. It was like my laptop doesn't like the projector by some reason. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm uh, Jose Castroleon, I'm working on the CERN cloud team. And uh, this talk is gonna uh, mention what we are doing, what we are doing in automation, and how we are moving towards a self-automated cloud. Uh, I'm the responsible for the identity and the uh, automation at CERN in the CERN cloud perspective. And in the CERN cloud team, if you want to know how it looks like, is this this is the cloud team. And <laughs> actually, we are. This is the. Uh, uh, Lunch that we did to celebrate that we upgrade the whole cloud to Queens. That was in July. And uh, I think we are missing one, because we actually were in Rocky. But anyway, the in, what we are going to talk about is the, to do a brief introduction of what is CERN and what, is the, uh, what the cloud service offers. We, look, we are going to zoom and check the automation, the automation part what we are doing at the moment, what the, uh, the uh, upcoming challenges at what we want to do. And if we have time, we can check also the source code. So I can give you what we are running. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It's the biggest laboratory for particle physics. It was founded in 1954, and it comprised 22 member states. But there are many more, and this is, you have here the map of all the states that are collaborating with CERN at certain levels. And we are mostly known by the, uh, one of the accelerators, the LHC, but this is the last of a complex of accelerators that we have running. Uh, this is the one that has 27 kilometer circumference. And here we have the map of how it's placed between the border, in, the border uh, between France and Geneva. From ionized gas, uh, we injected into the complex of accelerators, passing the whole history of CERN. And then we are, they are injected in the booster first, then after the proton synchrotron, then the super proton synchrotron, and then at that moment it will get into the let's see. And then this is where uh, we collide the particles and we, uh, we get the data. Um, so we go through all the history of the accelerators at CERN. Uh, there is also a small one that you maybe not, not, not see from there. There is the antiproton decelerator that is just close by where I'm working. And is the, if you want to know what it does, it's basically the, anti, uh, the dark matter factory. So the um, main mission for, the, for CERN is to do fundamental research in particle physics. What we do in uh, IT department is provide resources to the physicists to do their job, basically. And the cloud service offers a cell service, uh, cell subscription service to the physicists to do their job, to the whole laboratory, basically. Uh, has been production since July 2013, and since then we have been doing upgrades in place of the service, keeping the, uh, keeping, trying to keep the APIs as available as possible. Um, the control plane and all the hypervisors that we are running, they are on CentOS 7. And we have them distributed in two different data centers that are 20 milliseconds away from each other, that are one in Geneva, the other one in Budapest. Uh, the 9,000 servers that we have running, they are split or separated in more than uh, 70 cells in a highly scalable architecture because we offer only a single region to our end users to simplify their, the, their uh, use cases. And uh, as I mentioned just before, we are currently running the Rocky release before, so it just upgraded before uh, coming to the summit. This is the stats of the cloud at, not the Monday before, the Monday even before, last week. So we have 300,000 cores and we are, uh, that are available for the service. And we are using a slightly a bit more because we are overcommitting a bit. Um, we have 36,000 VMs running in 9,000 hypervisors. But as you can see over there, there are more uh, statistics. So we have also Kubernetes clusters, Magnum clusters inside, uh, or the other way around, bare metal nodes. We have also file shares and volumes. So we are offering all these resources to our, uh, to our users. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention is the, um, the flag over there with the create and delete. This is the ratio, the ratio of creation and deletion of machines at any moment on time. So this is quite high, basically, due to two reasons. 
One is the users, our users that are uh, experimenting with the cloud modeling. So the experiments are uh, creating machines, do their job, and then killing them later. So more cloudy way. And also, there is also a fraction. There's even there's ourselves that are we are probing the infrastructure just to make sure that it works and the users can benefit of uh, of the cloud service. Oopa, that's fast. Okay. This I split it in two. Anyway. Um, so when we started with the CERN Cloud Service, we started only with uh, Nova, with Glance, with Keystone, and with Horizon. Since then, we were adding uh, more blocks into the service. Now we have a network component, uh, our containers, container orchestration component, an orchestration component, and a secret uh, kit manager component. Um, we not only added services, we are also improving the offering on other areas, like now we offer VMs as well as uh, physical nodes. We also, in storage, we offer uh, block devices, and we offer also file shares. This layer is the building blocks in which our users create their, their applications. But then we, we didn't stop on that part. We continue even further uh, with uh, what we call the IS Plus layer, and we ourselves we are benefit, uh, using the benefit of this under layer. We are offering also more complex scenarios that we use in Magnum that just you create with a single API entry point. You create a cluster that is basically behind the scenes using the underlying resources. Uh, the automation, I'm here, I'm zooming out the architecture we have at CERN. And basically, the automation that we do they are covered by two different uh, components. We are using Mistral and Randec. In this case, I am only uh, showing the integration that we have, for example, with a part of the business logic at CERN, that is the resource lifecycle management, that is covered by Mistral. And then on this other side, I have the uh, service and host monitoring, that is covered, in this case, by Randec. Uh, I'm going to detail, uh, detail them a bit later. If we go back in time, before we even have the cloud, the computing requirements for the LHC were increasing. So right now, we are in, run, uh, in the end of run two. We are going to start the run three. The data requirements that were like that, they were getting exponential when we come to the last, fa last phase of the run, that is the high luminosity LHC. And the red bar is the, what we can afford to handle with the money, with the budget we have, and the expectation of CPU resources that we have. At the same time, and, and to add it even further, we, have, we know that we have a fixed uh, team that is going to manage those VMs, or those servers. So we need to double down and do more, uh, manage even more servers, and be more efficient to scale out the, uh, the infrastructure up to those levels. For this, when we started with the cloud service, automation was an enabler for us to be able to scale and manage the infrastructure. It was considered early on. And we are doing as much as possible. Because if not, we are not able to handle or manage the cloud. Now, the situation didn't change much, because now we have a 300,000 uh, 300, uh, 300, core cloud. And we are still increasing. You can see here the rate of, uh, of course, is utilized all, or the, over time. But we are not only scaling out the cloud, we are continuously adding more services. We are also improving the existing ones. We are offering more features. We are fixing uh, and providing more added value to our, our users. Uh, one thing that stays the same is the number of people. We have, we have the same size of the team. And, that, that's, and that doesn't, doesn't change. So automation changed from an enabler to key. Now is, we need to do automation. I'm putting three examples there. For example, if you have an, an issue on a, specific, uh, on a specific problem, if you code it and you create the, uh, you uh, code the, the workaround and the fix for that issue, you are doing two things in once. So one is you keep the knowledge on the team, so then this issue, this issue this is knowledge for your next guy that is coming doing the job in the cloud team. And the second, uh, in the second part is that you prevent it to happen. That is like 
probably the other way around what you wanted. You also, uh, if you have some tasks that are tedious or repetitive or they can, they can be handled by other teams, like for example, if you have an, uh, an error on a disk, you can automate that task and only Leave, uh, leave it at the moment so that in the, you only have to do to replace the disk. For that, we have a specific team at CERN that replaces the disk, the, C, the CPUs, and the motherboards. So then the whole automation to drain the node up to that moment can be offloaded and it uh, frees up you for doing other stuff. And at the last point, it's like we want to empower our users to, do, to manage themselves. So then the users can do as much as, the, so we can offload all the workload that we have in our side to manage the things, and we can focus on other stuff that we are, more inter uh, that we are first more interested to do, and then on the second, <laughs> that are more interesting also for the service. So the, the status of the automation right now at CERN is covered on these four areas part of automation, and then it's like we have the host and service monitoring that is basically taking care of the alarms, and uh, the service, uh, also the, so the hardware events and the service alarms that we have in our service. We have the integration with the resource lifecycle management, because every resource that we have a CERN needs to be tracked and needs to be properly handled. Uh, we focus on uh, optimize the resource availability and uh, to keep enough free resources for our users to deploy the applications. And we want to improve uh, the availability of VMs. So yes, uh, everyone knows that we shouldn't put PET on hypervisors, but for some reasons, there are still users wanting to do so. So we need to improve availability and performance there. If we go to the uh, service monitoring, we are collecting all the events that are in the hardware with Collect D. And also, we are collecting the service logs through Flume. All of them, they get piped into what we call the CERN general notification infrastructure that behind the scenes is running a Kafka queue. So it's like they get piped, and then that service generates tickets. For example, one case, repairs. We also have alarms for the service uh, in Grafana. And all these alarms and tickets, they are managed by uh, the tool that I mentioned before, Randek. This is the quite important and crucial for us because we, we can run like uh, different types of jobs there that do certain or specific tasks. For example, uh, series of cron jobs or event-based jobs that are targeting uh, specific events, and then they will fix the issue when it happens. We also have offloading to other teams, and I will show it a bit late. I will show it later, that in which we offload some of the jobs, these more administrative tasks, to other less knowledgeable teams to do the action that they want. And we can we use this tool to schedule interventions in the future. So then, for example, if the disk needs to be replaced, we can uh, schedule the intervention in advance, notify the user. Uh, so all this machinery we need to put in place to notify, to do the interventions, it can be automated. And this is what we are doing. So Randek is quite crucial for us, and we use it for heavily for delegating tasks. We rely on Randek for offloading tasks on these four teams. For example, the procurement team, that is the team that is responsible for adding services and removing services from, from the cloud. That's the guy that arrives and, okay, I have 200 servers that I need to, that I'm gonna install, I need to handle to you. And what we, what we did, what we have in, in, the, in Randek is basically a task in which they can run and they will, add, they will add those services into production. So be able to be used by us. Um, the repair team has a different, more or less the same access. It will be used, for example, in example that I put below, with the disk replacement. If it is a, an alarm produced and handled by Collect D, it will be piped, a ticket will arrive in service now, will be picked by the repair team, and will start uh, doing the intervention um, to replace the disk on the server. But it's not only sending a notification to the, to the user that something is going to happen in some period of time, it's also draining the host and ensuring the machine will be stopped by the time he wants to replace the disk. So that increases the efficiency uh, and their, their efficiency to change the uh, components. Uh, 
another key actor that we have uh, used in Randag is the resource coordinator. Uh, this, this person is handling all the resources that we have in the data center. So everything, every project request, every quota change, that gets passed through this, through this person and we'll approve it or deny it. Then what he does, basically, after his approval, the process of the project creation of quota or the uh, application of the quotas, there is completely automated. So we don't, basically, I'm not creating any projects since a while ago. And uh, for the, for, we are also using the service for common tasks. Basically, if we have a known error and we have the workaround, we have it there in the list of tasks that we can run uh, in case this uh, recurs. Now I'm jumping to the other side of the graph. Uh, all the resources at CERN, they are tracked. As the unit of ownership in OpenStack is the project, so the contract that we have with this engine is that we need to have a life cycle. First, we need to have a life cycle for the project. And second, we need to have uh, an owner in each project. So we can track a person that is going to be responsible for all the resources that are running. Basically, this person is the owner of the project that is translated into a role in Keystone. And then, then there are two types of projects. They are the personal and the share. So when you subscribe, you get automatically a personal project with a small quota out of the box. And then if you need more resources, or you want to run, because personal is for test and development. If you want to do more stuff and uh, run your services or your applications, what you create is a share project. The only difference between the two, because in terms of OpenStack, they are the same, the only difference between the two is the, what happens when the user leaves the organization. As we cannot afford to lose resources, we trigger some actions. And these are basically the actions that are run so then when the affiliation expires, we, we, the user doesn't have any contract at CERN anymore, what it was supposed to be production gets promoted. So then the resources and the applications are not lost. In the personal space, the personal area, we don't do nothing, and we wait until the project gets, until the user account gets disabled. At that moment, what we are doing is like with every other resource, resource at CERN, we block the access and we stop the VMs and the, all the resources. So in the rare event that is running, a user is running a production workload in a personal project, we can track it over there because we have a kind of at least some time between the two events. And then when the user is deleted, we clean up the stuff. All of this is done through Mistral workflows in which we all the plumbing between dependencies between the different services is managed inside. So what it looks behind, basically, is a set of workbooks in Mistral that are interconnected. So we have the project, uh, creation, re uh, retrieval, update, and deletion. And we also have the service-oriented the service -oriented part. If you have an example, if we have an example with the project deletion, this is what it looks like. It will check first that the project exists, and then we'll pass to the, let's say, the service deletion or service resource deletion, in which we have a kind of a graph like this one, and we'll do the, all the things in the top, going lower into the, uh, into the lower layer until it cleans up all the stuff. And once it's cleaned up, then it can uh, delete, do the deletion of the project. For the end user, what we have is basically a button in Horizon. So I'm putting an example here for the project creation because the project deletion is like, do you want to delete the, the project? Yes, and that's it. Uh, the, project <laughs> the project creation, what it shows up is a form with all the data that the resource coordinator needs for assessing, to assess if you are capable to run these resources and you're, if you are, you can <laughs> to decide if it approves or denies this, uh, this operation. Once you click on uh, accept, it will create a ticket in the snow assigned to the resource coordinator. Then he will trigger. We put also a link to approve if he approves the project. 
that trigger the project creation through Randec because the interface between the, the uh, ticketing system that is snow and, uh, and the automation is done through Randec. It will trigger the creation in Mistral. Um, and if we jump to the third point in which we need to maximize the resources that we run at CERN, we cannot afford to run resources that are idle or they are, doing, they are not doing anything. So we recently added an expiration to the VMs. So each VM that is now running in uh, the personal project has an expiration. And this is set shortly after creation and is evaluated daily. It's configured to 180 days and is renewable as many times as the user wants. This is implemented in, Mis in Mistral. And for example, I'm putting here an ex uh, what happens with an active VM that I extend it for some time, then I, f uh, then I don't want it anymore, then they will get expired. And what happens when it gets expired, the machine will be stopped and locked. So again, the same, po the same policy, we, we leave a grease period to identify if the machine was useful or not, and then the machine will purge. Do you know what happened when we enabled this in production? Six months ago? <laughs> oh, okay. I will tell you later. I have it on another slide. So we recovered 3,000 cores <laughs> that were idling. So basically, the, uh, we can use those resources for the future. How is this implemented internally? It's basically every instance has an attribute with that we call the uh, expire at attribute with a date. And for doing the, for knowing which are the projects that are candidates for expiration, basically we add a tag to the project. And this is implemented in three workflows that are nested. So then the first one is the global one that is run at midnight. Then it, tri it triggers as many expiration projects as projects you have. That will trigger as many expiry instances as instances you have. It will check the, if the uh, attribute is fine. It will fix it in if it's like a, the format is not correct or something like that. So if the user tries to modify something. And it will trigger, depending on uh, if you need to send a reminder, if you need to expire the VM, or if you need to delete it. And all of this, this is in a single work, uh, workbook in Mistral. We want to get more performance, and we have use cases uh, we have use cases at CERN in which the model in which we have uh, the compute nodes and the storage nodes connected over the network doesn't fit because they, what they require is more, so they, they require more disk capacity that we have in the, compute, in the compute nodes and they also require a small IO latency. So what we are preparing is a setup, an hyperconverged setup in which we mix the compute and the storage nodes. That will have a local Ceph pool uh, covering the ephemeral and also the volume access. And what it gives us is simplify the management because in case of a hardware event, something happens on that hypervisor, we can evacuate the machines and we can do it right now with live migration. And, uh, and then we can put there the DB and storage guys that are aiming to have a more storage that's what we offer right now, and also a uh, small I.O. If we look at what we are, look at the future and what we are going to do in the Sun Cloud for, uh, for the next, uh, next steps on automation, we are continuously adding services. So uh, this, this task over there is basically to improve the way that we add services into the, uh, into the cloud. Uh, to be more transparent and more easy for us for, to add more services. We, are, we want to empower our users to get knowledge of what is the infrastructure issues that we have behind, so that they can do automation on top of that. And for that, we, we are investigating to add the root cause analysis pro, uh, project behind, so we can tag the instances in which the server, for example, is having an issue behind. We are looking into Kubernetes jobs uh, to add it into the offering, basically moving all the, all the stuff that we have in Randec there 
and we, are, we want to double down and get more performance and more availability. So I, I will put an example of uh, adding a new service. We are looking to offering the S3 endpoint through the Rados gateway. Our colleagues of the, of the storage team, they have a Rados gateway that allows us to pipe it and connect it to the, um, to, to the cloud, and then you, you directly get it on the, on the APIs. And the, what I can tell you is the, project, the workbooks were, are prepared to be extended, so they have hooks uh, places in which you can add services, and this is this is kind of to make it simpler, simple to add uh, services on on the ser on the system, and for in order to do that for this particular uh, use case, uh, we are using the admin operations API in uh, for Rados Gateway. Basically, we need two libraries. One is the Python Rados Gateway admin that the our colleagues from Switch have the library for that. Basically, we only need, we have only to prepare a package for that. We create uh, a grapper to have this ac these operations in Mistral. This is the other one, the Python uh, Mistral Rados gateway actions. And then the last step, we modify the workflows. And this is how it looks like in the upcoming version to disable a user. Disable a user in Rados is, disable, is to disable the access of a project to that S3, all the buckets that are stored there. And with all the, this small snippet that gets in the, in the, workflow, in the workflow, it will uh, allow us to uh, clean up the resources, prop disable the resources properly, and then clean up later. Uh, we want to empower our users to get knowledge of what is happening behind the scenes in the infrastructure. And f in order to do so, we, are in we would like, we would, <laughs> integrate the uh, root cause analysis project. Uh, we have uh, several use cases in the past in which a CPU issue or the declaration after installation of a package uh, start to affect some services. And you don't get the knowledge of all the, what is this particular event, what, it, what are the, all the services that are affected by that. And this is something that, that Bitrust provides because it gives you alarms with a scope. So if something is coming, is, uh, so something is broken in this server, and it's affecting all these services, all these VMs that are running on top. And we can get easily, without uh, feeding up in the, uh, in the databases, which is the service, the, all the list of impacted services. On certain cases, if the user didn't provision his setup properly, it allows us to find hidden service dependencies, to find the, the why he's running two VMs on the same host, that probably is against his will, and it's something that we can uh, tell him. And to close down and to make it self-automatable, it allows us to trigger automatic resolutions. So for certain cases, we can code the workflow in Mistral and close the loop and provide a healing operation for the end users. So if something, if we come back to the issue with the disk, the collect will generate the alarm, will be picked by Bitrash, and can notify all the nodes, all the VMs that are running on the service. Uh, imagine that this is a Kubernetes cluster with uh, some, so you have a minion there that can notify the Kubernetes, so you can notify and evacuate the, the workload aside. So then the intervention will be more, more transparent for you. We are looking in the Kubernetes jobs. We have two steps here. Basically, we are moving the control plane to Kubernetes. We are not yet there, but we are moving though. And this is based on help charts. And all the healing operations, we can codify them or code it as jobs in this cluster. This is one side. On the other side, uh, Randeck, so we can, all the tasks that we are running right now in Randeck, we can dockerize them. So we can put it in Docker and execute it easily. If you, if you get a bonus point, now Randeck interface with Kubernetes. So it's a perfect match. So we are moving, moving the tasks that we have in Randeck into Kubernetes. So 
for the hyperconverged servers setup I was mentioned before, if you follow the guidelines on how to deploy these uh, services, you need to leave some fixed CPU allocation to ensure that you have enough I/O. Because if the even if this happens, like in this one, that this node is fully committed to CPU, he may not have as, enough spare cycles to cover the I/O operations that are done there. And what we want to do there, and this is what we were evaluating during the summer, was to dynamically adjust the usage and move things around. Because on this service, we can do live migration, so we can uh, automatically move the things around and keep the free resources for, for I.O., enough resources so we don't need to fix the allocation to the uh, required, uh, to the setup that is on the guidelines without avo avoiding impact on compute. And for that, we were using Watcher. And to go even uh, further, we can use um, the empty spaces that we have in the hypervisors, we cannot afford to have idle resources. We can use this empty space with spot instances, with printables. So then we can fill the hypervisor memory, and then if the user creates a, if another user creates a normal VM and this hypervisor is selected, it will free up space and kill and put the machine there. So then we can get a better utilization of the, of the machines. So if you want to know more about preemptible instances and spot instances, that is the add bar part, you can go to the, uh, there's a, another talk that's going to happen in th uh, on Thursday in the whole A3 by my colleagues on the cloud team. And for this particular case, what we can use for scheduling, it's like we can use, uh, again, Watcher, to, not, to get the CPU load and instance the machine spot instances of a certain kind. So I was showing a lot of graphs, a lot of diagrams. You can believe me or not, but I will show you the code. <laughs> That's probably what you want to. So if you go to this repo, uh, we have all the code that we, have, that we are using at CERN. So the first line is basically uh, we have the downstream, the downstream patches of all the projects that we run in this uh, link. We have the workflows that we're showing you for Mistral, doing expiration, doing project, um, project lifecycle management, uh, some of us uh, doing certain actions that we offer to our end users to simplify their life. Basically, uh, we have one, for example, for instance snapshotting. It's like the user doesn't need to know if the instance is put from volume or not. It has a button and clicks. And that's it. All of them, they are uh, in the Mistral workflow side. I, we have also the code for the Rados Gateway actions and the, the Rados Gateway admin libraries that we use for integrating Rados Gateway there. We have the request panel. This is the panel that we have in Horizon that just sits on, in front that has the buttons for interacting with the creation uh, quota requests and so on. And at last, we have the scripts and tools that we run in Randeck that will be dockerized uh, to be able to be used in the as Kubernetes jobs. And that's all for me. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? <laughs> Corporate. Please. Does it work? We can change. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any re particular reason to use uh, both Rundeck and Mistral? When any any reason to use both Rundeck and Mistral? Yeah. yeah. So basically, is historically, so when we started, there was no Mistral. <laughs> so, but it's, it's pretty convenient. The only thing I'm lacking in Mistral is the, like, the lack of change of scope, because the, I may need, in order to delegate those, those operations, many of them, they are kind of, uh, they are doing admin 
like operations, and the change of, of scope in, uh, role, in the role-based system in Mistral is not well done. So I, need, I may need to give them admin access on the cloud to be able to achieve the same operations. So basically, the, but the main reason is historically. It was the only thing available at the time that was, that was working well for us. Doesn't work. No. Uh, uh, hi. So I was going to ask uh, how many uh, clusters do you have for supporting this 9,000 compute nodes? Is it a single con control plane supporting all these compute nodes, or do you have multiple clusters? And what would be the maximum cluster size in your case? You mean the number of cells? Uh, number of cells or number of compute nodes per cells? <laughs> There, there is a next talk from one of my colleagues that is just there that it will tell you the number of that. But then the, um, yeah, so the thing is we are running 70 cells. That's the, we have at least 70 control planes for each cell plus a sub, uh, another one on top. But if you, want the, if you want to know the sizes, you better ask him <laughs> in, the, in the one. Can I ask a quick question about the hyper converged uh, uh, like node you were planning to deploy? But so the storage, I didn't get exactly the storage how it is provisioned. So what we are, so the hyper converged setup is a basically a set of machines that have more disk attached. So it's like a, okay. so we are, so it's machines with the, that we are gonna use two disks for the server for operations for the system, let's say the system drive, and the remaining disks are going to be OSDs in a Ceph pool okay. that we're configuring the cluster to be in. So the, the MDSs, the MONs, they're going to be running on the same rack. So you're not, you're not like going out of that rack for any Ceph or volume operation. So you get pretty, pretty decent uh, low latency. Okay. And uh, I didn't mention, but this, this cluster is, is going to be SSD. Only. Okay. So it's going to be even faster. Okay. So, no more questions. Thank you.